We honor you today, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. We thank you that you are the Good Shepherd, that you meet our deepest needs, and you lead us beside quiet waters. You guide us in green pastures. It is you who restores our souls. And we pray for that leading today. For hearts that are burdened, uh, that you would teach us to cast our burdens upon you, trusting you, hoping in you, believing in your goodness, trusting in your sovereignty, and following you no matter the cost. And Father, we also want to thank you that in this day、uh, we stand by grace alone. And we thank you that it is not what we have done or can do that makes us right with you. But we trust in the work, the saving work of Jesus on the cross. And so, Lord, today we desire to hear from you. So we ask that you would quicken and awaken our senses in the physical and in the spiritual realm. So that our eyes will see you, beauty, wonder through your word. Our ears will hear you and your voice clearly. That you would silence the voice of the enemy. And that our hearts would be open, humble, and receptive to not just receive your word, but to live it. And God, I ask that you would use me for your glory. God, let me simply be a mouthpiece. For your spirit to speak truth through today. All for the glory of the name of Jesus and his name alone. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight. O、oh、Lord, our rock, our redeemer. And it is in your priceless name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for those of us. For those of you who have been praying、uh, throughout this series on praying for your pastors. And also, I want to thank you for your prayers last week、uh, while I was in Hong Kong. I did have a great time in Hong Kong for the Justice Conference for Asia. I told our staff、uh, last week that I loved being there. And I realized I, I think I can get used to speaking at justice conferences. It felt really good to be with hundreds of other people who had that same heart and passion for a lot of the areas of ministry and vulnerability that God has been leading us into.、Uh, it felt really good.、Um, but you know, even though I was scheduled to speak、uh, last weekend in Hong Kong, all day Friday, Saturday,、um, and because of flight schedules, it was going to be difficult for me to come back. Uh, I briefly thought about trying to squeeze everything earlier on and possibly make it back for OEM last Sunday. And so last week before I left, I was busy each day trying to get the conference messages set and then the seminars set for that conference and then finishing up my teaching lectures for Torch.、Uh, and I was busy trying to finish this sermon for last week. So here I am, frantically. Trying to work more in a shorter amount of time while working on this message on rest. And so I had to say, hold on,、uh, let me try to live it out、uh, before I preach it. And so I had to say, not sing, let it go. <clears throat> And、uh, this, I think, is one example of why pastors need prayers for rest.、Uh, you know, we're in a new series that we started a few weeks ago、uh, on how to pray for your pastor. And 
Uh, it is important because pastors are on the front lines for a lot of spiritual battles for the church, for the ministries, and even for your own lives. And um, I was surprised at the number of people who came up to me after we started the series uh, saying that, Eddie, I'm, I, I've never even thought about praying for you. And other people would be like, I never heard a series or a sermon in my life on the need of praying for pastors. And so I didn't know whether to be encouraged or discouraged. Um, but regardless, I said thank you, and I hope it can influence us to pray more. And so we started this series by unpacking the need of intercessory prayers for pastors. And the first key prayer that we focused on a couple weeks back was uh, the importance of praying for protection for the spiritual leaders in our lives. And today, uh, the second key prayer request that I want to help us develop is uh, to pray for rest. So everyone repeat, pray for rest. Right? And that's what we want to focus on today. And if some of you are wondering, then why, you know, why were people surprised about the need of praying for pastors? And uh, when I asked some of them, they were actually saying it is because we always thought like pastors were spiritual leaders and you guys are supposed to be spiritually stronger than me. So I felt like you don't need my prayers. I need prayers. And so uh, it is important for us to banish those misconceptions and for you to know that we do need prayers. So follow along with me in your outlines and let's learn how to pray more effectively in this particular way. So the first way we need to pray for rest concerning pastors is to pray for physical rest. So everyone repeat, pray for physical rest. Because physical rest and physical care are probably two of the most neglected things in a pastor's life. And in Psalm 23, we see our great shepherd's concern for this area of physical rest. Psalm 23, verse 1 and 2, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I love verse 2. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. God has to do that to me quite often. <laughs> he makes me lie down, you know? Uh, you know, because some of us, we get so busy, so active that he needs to make us lie down and stop what we're doing. In his classic book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, Philip Keller says uh, that there are four things a sheep needs in order to really lie down. Uh, because, uh, because they are so timid, Number one, they will refuse to lie down unless they are free from all fear. So if they are in a fearful situation, they cannot lie down. Number two, because of their social behavior, they will not lie down if there has been friction between other sheep in their fold. So if somebody was trying to eat you know, their food or something, and they got like bitterness in their hearts, you know, the shepherd has to provide some peacemaking you know, sessions for them. You know? And number three, if bothered by flies or pest parasites, they will not lie down unless they are free from pests. And number four, they will not lie down unless they are free from hunger. And so the shepherd plays a si significant role in making sure that the sheep feel at peace in order to really lie down. So they need to be free from anxieties and fears in order to truly rest. So we need to pray that Jesus our true shepherd, would meet not just the basic needs, but the deepest needs uh, for our pastors. But sadly, for far too many pastors, it's not until a breakdown happens that they finally take a break. A few years ago, the New York Times and Leadership Resources, they uh, released a study on pastoral burnout. And they found that 40% of pastors and 47% of their spouses experienced burnout from ministry because of stress, conflict, and unrealistic expectations. Now, you notice that the spouses actually experienced higher levels of burnout. And that is because they too feel the same unmet and unrealistic expectations for themselves as well as for their spouse. And when conflicts happen, when criticism hits, 
A lot of times the spouse will also either be the target of it, but if not definitely impacted by the harm that was done to the um, pastor as well. Also, 80% of pastors in this survey and 84% of the spouses felt discouraged currently in ministry. That is astronomical in terms of how high the discouragement levels were at. You see, uh, this impacts their whole being, including how they started feeling physically, because it's all connected, right? How we are physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. You see, there's a close connection to our physical condition and our spiritual condition. So praying for physical rest is an important part of praying for the well-being of your pastor. This physical well-being, which is sometimes referred to as self-care, is often neglected but desperately needed today. Peter Brain defines self-care as the wisdom to ensure, as far as humanly possible, a wise and orderly work that conserves and lengthens a pastor's ministry. Things like going to bed on time, a good Sabbath, a good sabbatical, or taking vacation or days off, exercise, and even maintaining a nutritious diet. And one pastor says it's about burning on, not burning out. I don't know if many of us can finish well unless there's some type of rhythm of rest and restoration and relationship within our lives. Now, we must not neglect the physical part of our well-being as if that was not important. Another survey found that 76% of pastors were either overweight or obese in the United States compared to the national average, which was 61% of the general population. This shows the need for pastors to truly take a Sabbath and to experience the rest physically as God intended. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 and following says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. So a break from work is a proper rhythm of how God created creation's order. The rhythmic cycle that God created for us was to work six and rest one. That is the pattern of both work and rest that God created from the beginning. So God made us to be a people who were who are wired for rest. Now, Sabbath simply comes from the root word, which means to stop, to quit, or to cease from doing something. But it's more than just taking a day off to do whatever you want. There is instinctively something within us, within the rest, that is meant to be centered or re-centered around the Creator, in the place of worship and in the place of trusts. But for many ministers, they work seven days a week, which is the preparation grounds for eventual burnout. For a small number, it is because of their inclination towards a workaholic tendency, which I confess I still struggle with sometimes. But for many pastors, uh, what perpetuates a seven-day work cycle is due to the pressure they feel from the church or from members and the guilt of not working. Uh, or the fear of not meeting the standards uh, that they feel that they must reach. Uh, you know, there is a common joke of a little boy who came to shake the pastor's hand after church service when he said, my dad says he wished he had your job. Oh, yeah? Why is that? Because you only work one day out of the week. Uh, that's how many people may think of pastoral ministry, but reality is far from different. It's, it's very different. Uh, with many pastors working between 60 to 80 hours a week, uh, but without being able to take a mental stop at all during that time. You see, we are created by God in such a way where all creation is meant to have this rhythm of work and rest. Now, notice in Exodus 20, it even includes the livestock, that it's not just about you and your family and your servants and your maidservants. He says also your livestock, meaning 
all of creation is created to inc be included in this rhythm of rest and work because that is where proper restoration is to be centered and grounded upon. So pray for physical rest for your pastors. But also, another area that we need to be in prayer for is to pray for emotional rest. So everyone repeat, pray for emotional rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus invites all who are burdens and weary to come to him. Because it is in Jesus that we find true rest. In verse 29, he says, learn to let Jesus carry your burdens and share in your yoke. He is gentle and you will find rest for your souls. And in Psalm 23, verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. You see, it is in the presence of Jesus that true rest and restoration happens. Because one of the most important lessons that we learn in keeping Sabbath is learning to trust that God is God and we are not. And that is a good thing. Pete uh, Scazzaro, author of Emotionally Healthy Church and Spirituality, says, at the heart of Sabbath is stopping to surrender to God in trust. We imitate God by stopping our work and resting and I give up control and trust God to run his world without me. You see, our flesh by nature uh, is inc inclined to rely on self, to be in control. But the heart of faith stays centered on trusting that as long as God is in control, I don't need to be. And that is one of the biggest challenges for all of us, even pastors. Learning to give up control as we trust in God's control over all things. He restores my soul. Now, why is this so important to remember? Because rest is not always an easy thing for pastors to do. Because they will often feel responsible for everything at all times. It's kind of like when you're hosting a party in your home. Uh, you're often not fully rested. Why? Because you're concerned, you're worried. Is everybody entertained? Is there enough food? Is there enough drinks? If something runs low, you want to make sure that you have refills. But once everyone leaves, then you can relax. Right? And pastors are similar. There is a constant feeling of responsibility that is hard to let go of. You know, I shared when I first came to OEM uh, several years ago about the deep burnout that I experienced when I was pastoring in Sydney, Australia. Um, and those years of experiencing burnout and my sabbatical after that was probably one of the most difficult time periods in my life. I was a workaholic who loved ministry. Uh, I started this new ministry in Sydney, and whenever you start a new ministry, it requires extra energy extra effort, extra uh, just exertion of your time, your money, your mind, all that energy. Uh, and back in those days, I did all the teaching of all the courses, all the preaching, all the leadership training, all the small group training. Um, and at the, in the very beginning of the ministry, I also did all the praise leading. Um, and I led all the mission training, even leading multiple mission trips at the same time, the same year, training multiple uh, leaders to take over teams eventually. And on top of that, I was working on my doctorate degree, uh, reading several books a week, working on my dissertation. And you're wondering, how did you do that? I do not know. Um, I do not think I could do that again. But the thing that started burning me out uh, more than my workload was the criticism the struggles and the lack of support that I would get from some of the leaders on the Korean side of the church. Uh, having to fight for some of the smallest things, that was starting to make me weary. But also, the emotional pain of betrayal was probably one of the hardest things for me to s swallow as well. You see, for me, uh, one thing that uh, I want to share about how I'm wired, feeling fully supported gives me strength. Like, I feel I could do anything. Uh, so the phrase that I'll use sometimes with uh, 
certain people or certain ministries, when I really fully feel uh, that, man, this is my partner, we're going to do life and ministry, we're going to go through, I mean, hell together, I mean, we're going to fight for each other. When I feel that, a phrase that I'll often say is, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, let, let's go into battle. Let's fight for each other. Let's fight and build the kingdom of God. And I'll say this often. Uh, and that phrase, let's do this, it probably encapsulates m- the joy that I have in ministry for the journey that we are on. To have a partner to do life and ministry together with. Uh, but for my burnout, um, I was praying for and longing for people to be able to look in the eyes and say that to Say, let's do this together. And I still clearly remember the exact moment that I broke down emotionally uh, from burnout. Up until that point, um, I was still able to run full steam ahead. Uh, Back then, I only had two speeds, 100 miles per hour and zero. (laughs) Um, And I was always at 100 miles per hour. And in the midst of my heavy workload, I was still doing okay, uh, but I knew I needed help. And then somebody came along and said, Eddie, you know, I'm here for you, to support you, to partner with you. Uh, For the first several months, not much really happened, but I really needed help because mission training was starting, and that usually took a lot of my energy. So I asked this person to lead one of the mission teams, uh, but in the middle of the training, he said to me, Eddie, sorry, you know, but I don't feel like going on missions this year, and he ended up playing golf instead. And so in the middle of mission prep, uh, I realized that I I have to take on this other team too. Um, Something broke inside of me. Uh, I literally felt something like just get crushed inside of me. Uh, like, and I still remember the exact moment, the conversation, where we're at, the words that he said, literally that sentence, something broke. All the wind in my sails got sucked out. All the joy, all the energy, every small ounce of energy that I was holding on to to just keep going another day, it got depleted. And for the rest of that year, I remember I was crawling to finish what I started that year. And uh, that was the last year that I was actually pastoring for that particular ministry. Uh, I needed desperately a sabbatical after that. I was carrying, 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 and the weight of ministry was on my shoulders for too long, and it became a burden. And when I got depleted of energy and joy and motivation, I realized something is wrong. And you know what? I'm talking to a lot of pastors. um, Throughout this series, I realized that many pastors feel like that right now. You see, um, you can choose to not show up today, but pastors can't. You can leave for another church next week, But the pastors can't. Why? Because they feel the responsibility for the ministry. So one of the best ways to encourage and strengthen your pastor emotionally is to pray, yes. But one survey found, uh, one result was, you know what really encourages pastors? When you show up. When you serve. And when you support the ministry. Showing up to events, they say that we invested so much thought, prayer, time, money, energy into for them, (laughs) and they come, that encourages them. Because when there's that much investment into it, brainstorming, thinking, planning, praying for something to serve the body and they don't show, that depletes people of energy. Also, serving in ministries that encourages pastors and supporting ministries, strengthens your pastors. But the emotional hit that happens to the heart through criticism, conflicts, and even apathy from others can deplete pastors of the emotional strength to keep going. One pastor who was interviewed uh, on this topic of burnout said this, it was hard to keep fighting week in and week out for people who did not seem to care about me or the ministry. I know that it's not the case for everyone, but the ones who took the effort to communicate to me were the ones who were most dissatisfied with me and the church. 
I just couldn't go on anymore, so I left the ministry. You know, this quote uh, by this pastor reminded me of why we did the Voice of Love campaign several years ago for adoption. Um, and of, uh, probably a lot of you weren't here during that year. And just to review a little bit, the reason why we started a Voice of Love campaign um, was uh, basically what it was, was gathering testimonies of people who were adopted uh, overseas uh, through the Korean system. And we recorded testimonies of people who were really blessed by the adoptions. And we wanted to let the government know that there were positive adoption stories. And the reason why we did that is because until that point, uh, there was a small voice, but a very loud voice, that was against adoptions. But that voice was the voice that kept going to the governments. And so because of that, the government made some law changes to discourage adoptions from happening, especially internationally. And so uh, the government was only hearing those negative voices, and they were thinking, a lot of them, I talked to some of the government officials, they were thinking that, oh my goodness, international adoptions are horrible across the board, uh, because they only would hear the negative stories. And so, uh, because if you think about it, if you had a positive adoption story that life is good, life is great, you're enjoying life, you're not going to think about making an effort. You know what? I should contact the Korean government and let them know that life is good for me. You're not going to think like that because you're just enjoying life. But if you had a hard life and a hard adoption story, those people did think about and made an effort to contact the Korean government and say, hey, you know what? It's not all roses. I had a bad story, and it's, it stinks. So I'm not trying to discredit, like, yeah, there, there are hard adoption stories, just as there are dysfunctional biological families. There will be dysfunctional adopt, adoptive families as well. But they were a small percentage, and they were the loud percentage that made its way to the government's ear. And so that's why we did the Voice of Love campaign. So we gathered the testimonies to at least let them know, you know what, government, there are positive stories, believe it or not, that came from this. And as a result, uh, that year we were able to see some law changes in favor of international adoptions. Now, I share this story because what happens in the church is also very similar. The negative voices are smaller in number, but usually the loudest and often... Those are usually the loudest, and oftentimes they will be the ones who make the effort to communicate their displeasure to the pastor. Those who are content or happy oftentimes will not make the effort because, again, things are fine. Uh, that's fine, except what ends up happening many times is that the negative voices are the main voices that pastors end up hearing time and time again. So in light of that, it's not surprising that we learn that 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month just in the United States. You know, it's been said that pastors think about quitting at least once a week, and it's usually on Mondays. Uh, so I share these things to ask you to pray for the emotional strength and rest and encouragement for your pastors, that though they face critics and even enemies, that the presence of Jesus would be their rest and source of restoration. As Psalm 23 also says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You see, for sheep, even in the midst of fog and when visibility is low, the shepherd would tap his staff, reminding them that the shepherd was nearby, even though they could not see their shepherd. And so we want to pray for a deep-seated rest for the emotional strength of our pastors. Amen? And a third way to pray for this rest is to pray for spiritual rest. So everyone repeat, pray for spiritual rest. Psalm 116, verse 7. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has, dwelt, has dealt bountifully with you. So he's commanding his soul 
to go back to your true place of rest, to go back and rest before the Lord. Why? It says, because the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, meaning the Lord has been good to you. He has been gracious to you. Rest in his goodness, rest in his grace. Because of his character, because of his sovereignty and control, we can be at rest before him. And I love Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2. He says, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. This is a crucial, tr crucial truth that we must never forget, that our soul finds rest in God alone. My soul finds rest in God alone. What does this teach us? That there is a rest for our soul that cannot come through any amount of sleep or any amount of vacation days. There is a rest that we only experience that is found in the Lord. Amen. You see, for some, the biggest challenge of a spiritual shepherd is to rest in the true shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ. Therefore, pray that we would be able to drink deeply from the water of life and find our daily refreshment in him. So pray that pastors too would be able to rest in our identity in Christ, that our identity and our security would be found in him, not in titles, not in demands, not in expectations, not in the approval of others, so that even if titles are gone, people are gone, the applause is gone, joy would remain because our joy is found in the Lord. You see, even pastors need to be reminded of the gospel over and over again, that Jesus came to give true rest, and that comes through resting in his work. We always need to remember that true faith is really about resting in the risen Savior to make us right and righteous. Even pastors will get caught up thinking that sometimes our work and our ministry is what keeps us in a right relationship with God. So pray for spiritual rest that relies fully on the work of Christ. You see, burnout and lack of rest is one of the top factors that eliminate pastors from ministry. And even the other top factors of moral failure and conflicts, these are the top three reasons why pastors leave the ministry, those top factors usually begin with a deep burnout that leads them down that road. Burnout is high in pastors because unlike other addictions, workaholism is often admired, encouraged, and even applauded in the church. It's one of the few addictions that people will give praise for. The Journal of Clinical Psychology states that pastors have the highest overall work-related stress and are almost at the lowest in terms of having the personal resources to cope with the strain. And what they also discovered is the longer you continue without proper breaks, the longer it will take to recover when you finally do try and take a break. When I was burnt out in Sydney, it took me two years to recover. I first took one year completely off, and at the end of that first year, I felt like I did not even take one day off yet. That's how long it took me to unwind. Um, and it's a challenge. And one of the things that I found about my time here in Korea is it still takes me a long time to unwind. It usually takes me two weeks to begin feeling like I could start to unwind, but usually that's when I have to go back to work. <laughs> um, so it is not easy for a pastor to rest. You know, I did a random search online and stumbled upon this website dedicated to pastoral burnout, pastorburnout.com. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's real. Uh, there's a section on the website 
for pastors to share their burnout stories. And it was so heartbreaking to read these stories. Um, so many who feel tired and weary from serving the body of Christ. If you have time or are interested to read, please pray for some of these guys if you visit the website. Heartbreaking. Let me just share a few of these, their stories with you. One pastor, initialed CE, wrote, entitled, It's Not Fun Anymore. I started out pastoring with all the zeal and energy of a five-year-old on a playground, but now after over 20 years in the ministry, I honestly dread it. I used to love Sundays. Now, I can't wait for them to be over. The only problem is they keep coming around. The crazy thing is, the current ministry that I now oversee was almost completely dead when I got there. Today, it's doing really well. You would think that I would be thrilled, but I'm miserable. Yes, I read the Bible. Yes, I pray. Yes, I read the books. I even went to see a doctor. But I still spend my days daydreaming about leaving and doing something else. Of course, it's complicated with my kids, my wife, our community, but I'm fed up with being a pastor. I can't remember what it feels like to be a normal person. I know I've got it good. I know God loves me, but I'm worn out, and I feel so guilty to be so. I know you don't know me, but I would appreciate your prayers. Another pastor from the southeast part of America wrote, I no longer have energy or excitement for this work. I sort of mail it in. I've been recycling old sermons, and I haven't been able to write a new sermon for several years, going through the motions. God's people should have better than that, I know. I just don't want to do this anymore, and it makes me feel so guilty. People still encourage me because of my work and ministry. They love my sermons and Bible studies. But because of how I feel, I feel like I'm such a fake. Pastor Gary from Ohio, I'm struggling to hang on with an aging congregation and with visionless leaders beside me. A place where fear rules everything. I've looked around for other churches, but at 57 years of age, I don't exactly jump to the short list of candidates. I'm tired I'm just plain tired. I don't sleep well. I struggle with depression and anxiety, and I feel my love growing cold. And like many of you who wrote on this, on this website, I want to leave ministry, but I don't know where to go or what I can do. Another pastor wrote of how he took two bottles of sleeping pills, hoping that he would never wake up again. Another pastor wrote, I feel stuck with no money, no hope, no future, and I feel like such a fake preaching about a God who gives hope and a future. I'm going to speak at a conference soon about recharging pastors, but I feel like such a hypocrite. I'm the one who needs recharging, not them. I need a long sabbatical. No, maybe a long sleep would be better. No, maybe resting in peace would be the best. You know, I was surprised at how many had suicidal thoughts. And what was also surprising is in my research for this uh, sermon, um, I, I did, just did a random search in Google News on pastors, uh, pastor suicide. And I was shocked at how many were committed this past year in the United States. Uh, there is an, al an alarming rate of pastors who are choosing that option. Um, and so you don't think uh, there's warfare? You don't think pastors need prayers? Uh, they need a lot of prayers of protection. They need a lot of prayers for rest. Amen. I'll end on a lighter story that I came across on that website. After a church service, a little boy told the pastor, When I grow up, I want to give you a lot of money. So encouraged, the pastor was like, Thank you. But why? Because every week, my daddy says, you're one of the poorest preachers we've ever had. <laughs> so I don't know whether do we laugh or cry about that one. There are a lot of great burdens placed on pastors. And one of the most important prayers that you could pray for them is that they will be able to give their burdens into the hands of Jesus. May the pastors in your life also be able to cast all their cares on Christ because they know he cares for them. 
As we began this series with this principle, which is, I think, a truth, is that your prayer support is the pastor's life supports. So know that your prayers are important. And even this week, to pray life-giving prayers of rest for their souls. Amen?